It is my pleasure to introduce to you James Eklund, member of Sherman Howard Law Offices who leads the water and natural resources practice. Mr. Eklund is going to educate us about the sustainability of the Colorado River. James works with sovereign governments, multi-state authorities, state agencies, and private interests to deliver critical water infrastructure projects and to design policy regarding water law, natural resources, infrastructure, and environmental protection. CU Denver and DU even allow him to lecture on water, public policy, and democracy on occasion. In the long ago, James served as Colorado's lead negotiator and signatory to the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan back in 2019. As director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board, he was the architect of Colorado's first water plan in 2015, the largest civic engagement process in state history. James has served as legal counsel to Colorado's governor and as assistant attorney general. His favorite endangered species is the razorback sucker because he thinks of himself as sharp but gullible. I'll turn it over to James, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good to be with you, thanks for coming back from uh, lunch and difficult to follow a uh, Hall of Famer uh, like Carl Mecklenburg uh, with, with a topic that sometimes can be dry even if I am gonna be talking about water, so. Um, there aren't that very, there aren't very many of you and when I'm in a group that's this intimate, I'd like to know who I'm talking to. So can you just tell me who you are and where, what water basin you you live in? I'm, I'm just here from OIT. All right, well you live here in Denver? South Platte Basin. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm, uh, I live in Colorado Springs. Uh, you're in the Arkansas, in Colorado Springs. Livermore near Wyoming. Livermore near Wyoming. So you're going to be in the uh, South Platte as well. Platte. Yes, ma'am. Up there. Yes, ma'am. Headwaters. Good. South Platte River Basin. All right. Jim, in the Bear Creek watershed, we believe in South Platte. Yeah, nice. All right. You're in the South Platte too? Yeah. Um, you are in the South Platte. South Platte? Excellent. All right. Welcome. South Platte? from Fort Collins, so the uh, Poudre drainage of the South Platte Basin. All right. Kyle from Windsor. Yep, South Platte. All right, fantastic. Uh, go over here. From I'm Corey. Right. I guess I'm in the South Platte. Like All right. I'm Kaylin. I'm in the Colorado. All right, <laughs> nice. Represent the Southwest. Yeah. I like it. Arkansas, you bet. Fantastic. Um, I'm the, we're all in the OIT servicing department corrections, so we're kind of odd ups, I guess. Oh, you're everywhere. You 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 probably get all the uh, you probably touch every single river basin. Yeah. Maybe with the reception exception of the Republican River, clear out on the eastern Maybe plains. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fair enough. And then back up here. Uh, Colin, must be South Platte. South Platte. And what? South Platte. South Platte, all right. And the cameraman, I'm gonna guess, is South Platte. All right, fantastic. All right, so you're, you're gonna get a crash course here. Um, it's fitting that we're in the Department of Law because water law in Colorado is a really uh, unique and special area. We don't have uh, any, no other state in the union has water court, only Colorado. That's right. So. You uh, have that distinction, but you also have the distinction of being the headwater state. Uh, 18 downstream states and the country of Mexico get water that start in your snowpack. So it's, it's really a, a, an amazing place to be a water lawyer because you've got a lot of eyeballs on you even if they're not in Colorado. Uh, the other, well, this is, this is the cocktail uh, hour uh, uh, fact that you can throw out the next time you're having a beverage with somebody. Uh, there are two states in the United States that have no major rivers that flow into them. 
They are Colorado and Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii is, uh, is obviously in the middle of the ocean, so there are no rivers that flow into that state. Similarly, there are no major rivers that flow into Colorado. Everything exits the state. Uh, the Arkansas, the South Platte, the North Platte, the Colorado River complex on the Western Slope and the Rio Grande and the Republican River all exit the state of Colorado. So, uh, it, it's a particularly good place if you're from here or even if, if you're not even originally from here, if you're, if you're now from here, it's a very good thing to know something about our water and how much of, we, of it we get to use and how much of it has to leave the state. So this is usually, well, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna have mercy on you guys. I usually ask what uh, mountain range this is. <laughs> and having a, uh, uh, I'm not going to make the custodian say what river basin she's from, but uh, th it's a trick question because this is a, this is a mountain range in Norway, uh, and it's where my great-great-grandparents uh, came from uh, to homestead in 1888. They homesteaded this place, which is actually in Colorado. Uh, North Sky Ranch is on the north side of Grand Mesa in Mesa County, far eastern Mesa County. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the Western Slope, it's about 45 minutes due east of Grand Junction. So that's, that's where we homesteaded in 1888. It's a cow-calf operation that we raised Black Angus, and I still get to stay involved with that. I manage it, and I'm the general counsel to the ranch in addition to practicing water law for my clients. So uh, this is a, probably the most important map I'm going to show you today. I'm going to show you a lot of maps. Uh, and it is a map that John Wesley Powell, who was the first U.S. geological surveyor to come to the western part of the country, uh, this, is, this is his map. And he thought it would be a great idea if instead of these arbitrary survey lines uh, that we drew the states uh, into, he thought it would be better if we did it by river basin. So I intentionally started out asking you about your river basin because according to John Wesley Powell, here in the South Platte, you would have been in your own state if he would have had his way. Uh, obviously, he didn't win that argument and we went ahead and did the arbitrary lines on the map. Uh, but before I leave this view of the map, this is the line to sear into your brain. This is the 100th meridian. Everything to the west of this line has got to be irrigated in order to grow. Okay? Sink the, everything to the east of this line, for the most part, and climate change is messing with this, but to the east of this line, generally, temperature, humidity, uh, usually mean that you, and precipitation, mean that you can grow things without irrigating them with a sprinkler or flood irrigation. They just grow. And if you're in Iowa, you know what I mean. If you've, if you've seen it, there's fields of corn that are growing on their own. They're not irrigated. So that's the distinction. And this is the line that makes the water law and policy and the way water works in the West, this is why we have a different system than everybody east of this line. East of this line, it's a water law called the Riparian Doctrine. And the Riparian Doctrine just means if you own land next to the river, you get to use the river. And you can use pretty much as much as you want as long as you don't injure the river. But we're talking about very, very different rivers east of this line than the ones out here. These are much, much smaller in terms of volume river systems. And as a result, not everybody has land near the river or near a water supply. So when miners came out here to mine and people started growing food to support those folks, the uh, idea was we've got to have a different way of doing water law in west of the 100th meridian because we don't have people that own land. These miners didn't own land next to a river. And they needed the ability to go get the water out of the river and bring it to a sluice box and do their mining or do their irrigation if they didn't own land next to the river. So we came up with this doctrine of prior appropriation. Um, this is the state of Colorado right there. It was drawn out of, like, there's Nevada. 
Um, it was drawn by President Lincoln and President Grant because we wanted, they wanted to lock up the nation's mineral resources during the Civil War. They wanted the Union to have it, not the Confederates. So we drew this line, uh, this, this rectangle, to uh, essentially carve Colorado out of the Utah, Kansas, and uh, New Mexican territories. So that's how your state came to be. And you just so happened as this accident of history got the major headwaters of all these river systems, like the South Platte and the Arkansas and the Colorado and the Rio Grande, here in this rectangle. And that's what makes Colorado the special place when it comes to water law and policy. So there's a little tiny blue line that just showed up on this map, and it's the Laramie River. And the Laramie River is important because the Laramie River, while it's very small, has some really senior old ranchers on the Wyoming side of the border. And those senior ranchers didn't like the idea that we here in Colorado had to divert the entire flow of this river into the basin you're currently in. We thought, wouldn't it be a great idea for us to get some more water into the South Platte and the Poudre system? Let's, let's divert the whole flow in there. And, and we thought that was a great idea. And uh, the Wyoming didn't. And so what happens when two states sue each other? You're in the Supreme Court building here, so. When two states sue each other, two sovereign states sue each other, it goes straight up to the US Supreme Court. Doesn't go to district court, doesn't go to a circuit court, it goes straight up. So Wyoming sued Colorado and said, do not do this project because you're going to violate our senior water rights. And we said, to hell with your senior water rights. We are the senior, we're, we're, we're just sovereign nation, a sovereign state. We can use as much water as we damn well please. And those two arguments battled in 1906 and the Supreme Court sided with Wyoming and said, yeah, if you've got two states that apply this doctrine of prior appropriation, which is first in time, first in right, so if I sink my shovel into a river in 1888 and you come along in 1890, I get all of my water before you get a drop. Does that make sense? So if, 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 um, Wyoming would have lost this case, we would have been really fat and happy in Colorado because we would have gotten all the water that originates here. How much water originates in Colorado? A lot. In the Rocky Mountains, we get between 10 and 14 million acre feet of water a year. And that means, so what's an acre foot of water, you're gonna ask? Well, an acre foot of water, if you go down to where Carl Mecklenburg played football. I don't know what they're doing at Mile High Stadium right now, but when he played actual football, the, uh, if you go down there or any football field, chop off the end zones and fill it up a foot high full of water. That's an acre foot of water, okay? And that'll get you, uh, that'll get two, three, sometimes four average size households through one year on one acre foot of water. So the fact that we have 10 to 14 million of these acre feet of water in this state uh, that, that comes in the form of snowpack every year is a really remarkable thing. That's a lot of water. But because Wyoming won this case, we had a real problem on our hands because, well, who cares about the Little Laramie River? When you look at the Colorado River, who is developing faster, Los Angeles or Grand Junction? Los Angeles, and not by a little, by millions of people <laughs> more. So the, th this is, this is the, the basin we were concerned about. We could not have a situation where we were going to apply the doctrine of prior appropriation across this basin because all the senior water rights would have been where? Who gets all the water if they develop it first? Right here, not here, not in your state. How many people live in Colorado? How many? Oh, uh, How many people live in Colorado? Anybody know? About six million on a good day. Six million. How many people live in California? Forty. Forty million people live in California. So to think that we were going to somehow develop at the same pace as this part of the country and this part of the country and even Las Vegas in Nevada ain't happening. 
So we were going to have junior water rights, which would mean that we would be out of priority and wouldn't be allowed to divert water under the law, even when there was water to, you know, running in the river. We would have had junior rights. So we really had to do something different. And this is a huge basement, 243,000 square miles, 40 million people depend on this river basin for their water, millions more, tens of millions more depend on it for food in this country. Uh, so national food security, if you just took this basin as its own GDP, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. So uh, we've had 20 years of aridification, I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, 50 years of rap rapid growth, I'll talk about that as well, and then this 100 year law of the river. So what we did is we said, we're going to put a compact, an interstate compact into this basin as opposed to this doctrine of prior appropriation. So if you're, if you're sitting here going, well, that's a great idea, Colorado, but why in the world would you do a interstate compact? Why would you do anything different than the law of prior appropriation if you are down here? Well, the reason is you, you, normally you wouldn't because you'd have all the senior water rights and that's what you, that's what you want. But the reason these folks decided maybe an interstate compact's a good idea for us is because they wanted this little dam on the river right here, Hoover Dam. They wanted that, and yes? Yeah, yeah, so I, I will get to that, I promise. Um, so Hoover Dam was built uh, as a result of the state of California going to the US Congress and saying, we need a dam because we're tired of this river turning into a behemoth like the Incredible Hulk in flood years and being a trickle in dry years. We need to store water in this basin or we're gonna have a problem. And we're already having problems. The, the part of the basin that grows most of the food is the Imperial Irrigation District down here in Southern California. And they had a canal because landowners in the Imperial District had land on both sides of the border. They had Mexican land and they had American land. And so they had a, 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 a back in the 19, uh, early 1900s, they had built a canal that went down into Mexico and came back up and irrigated some of the Imperial Valley side, the U.S. side of the border. And the, the uh, canal was great, but it was subject to the jurisdiction of the Mexican government, which was not as reliable and consistent as the law of the United States. So the uh, owners of these lands decided we're gonna build an all-American canal just on our side of the border so that the Mexican government has no control or authority over the water that we put in it. While they were building this canal, this all-American canal, they built a dam to channel the river away from where their constructions was, was occurring and that dam broke and for three or four years, the entire flow of the Colorado River went into an area called the Salton Sink, and it created the Salton Sea. So the Salton Sea was not there prior to this accident. Then uh, we, we, we basically created a huge wetland where it's a, it's a huge flyover stop on a migratory bird pattern from Mexico all the way up uh, through North America. But that's how that came to be. That was the type of accident that was so catastrophic to the basin and to California that they needed to do something drastic on the law side of this whole story. So they went to the Congress and said, you know that idea that the upper basin states have about a compact? We're in for that. We, we like that. And Congress said, good, because we weren't going to give you any of that Hoover Dam money unless you agreed how much each state was going to get to use. So that's what drove the states to the negotiating table and they came up with a compact in 1922 that essentially, I just drew that little uh, line on there, essentially cut the basin in half, 
we couldn't figure out how much each state should get. We couldn't agree on what that formula looked like. So we cut the basin in half uh, at, at a random place called Lee Ferry, Arizona. And there's nobody that lives at Lee Ferry. It's if you've ever rafted the Grand Canyon or know people who have, they might put in at Lee Ferry and go down the Grand Canyon. But that's, that's where we decided to carve uh, the, the basin in half. We said seven and a half million acre feet of water is available for use in the upper basin, seven and a half in the lower basin. And, and then in 1944, we came along with an international treaty with Mexico and said that they get 1.5 million acre feet. Incidentally, it's the exact same base, it's the exact same treaty that governs the Rio Grande River. So it's, uh, it's a really important treaty that we signed in 1944. If you add those numbers up, seven and a half and seven and a half and 1.5 million acre feet, you get a number. Well, there's the river. Let me just tell you why it's important um, that you pay attention to what goes on in the Bay Area of California when it comes to water. It's in four easy steps. So the first line I'll draw is this one right there. That's, that's the line uh, that represents the Trans Mountain Diversions that bring water to you on the Front Range. So if you said you were from Denver or the region around the metro area, you get anywhere from half to 70% of your water out of your faucet is from the Colorado River. So that's why it's important, even though you're not, you might be saying, why is this guy up here rambling on and on about the Colorado River? What's that have to do with me sitting in Denver? Half of your water, if you're a Denver water customer, comes from this basin. So you've got to know where it comes from. And frankly, sometimes the, the hardest working water in the basin, in the Denver water system, is from the Colorado River. Um, that's the first line. The second line is the, the river itself. It cuts down through these seven states and then uh, goes down to Mexico. And then you have these big diversions out of the river. Uh, one, the one I drew first is the California Colorado River Aqueduct, and that takes water to the Southern California area. Uh, the other place Southern California gets their water is from the Bay Delta uh, up in Northern California. So that's important. That, that's what gets you in four easy steps to the Bay, El Bay, Bay Delta. Well, um, we had our litigation up here over the Laramie River. Arizona did not really like the interpretation that California had of this interstate compact. So they sued California in the 1920s and said, look how much of our state, California, is in the Colorado River Basin. The entire state is in the Colorado River Basin. How much of your state, California, is in the Colorado River Basin? Not much. Therefore, we think it's only equitable that we get to use all the water out of all these tributaries, all of them, the Gila, the Salt, the Little Colorado, there's one called the Bill Williams, there's a bunch of tributaries on the Arizona side of this basin, and they said, we think that we should get to use all of this water without it coming out of our apportionment, okay? California said, no, 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 no. We carved up this river, and we meant the entire basin not just the parts that are in California or other states. We meant your state too. So, you know, basically go to hell. We don't, we're not taking that argument. Uh, so, Supreme Court litigation goes on for decades. They have the coolest, the coolest title in water law, in my opinion, is a special master, which is what the Supreme Court appoints to hear a case involving different sovereign states. And the Supreme Court appoints a special master. Uh, that person was fairly senior. They died in the middle of the litigation. Another one was appointed. That person died. Another one was appointed. They went through three, I think maybe four special masters before the Supreme Court litigation was all finished. And what the Supreme Court concluded in 1955 was that California was wrong and Arizona was right. They said, California, sorry, but Arizona does have all these rivers in it, and it really has sovereign control over the administration of that water. We're not going to sit here and say that that has to include all of their apportionment. So 
Cal Arizona has 2.8 million acre feet of water that they are legally allowed to take out of the Colorado River pursuant to the compact and the way all the agreements have flowed out from that in 1922. So Cal Arizona said, they popped the champagne and said, we win, we've won this argument, it's wonderful. Uh, we get, not only do we get all of the use of our tributaries, but we get 2.8 million acre feet out of this river. So we can build a 250 mile canal across the desert and grow Phoenix and Tucson and the uh, Scottsdale and that whole Arizona megaplex. And, and so they were very excited. Well, how much of this state is federal land? Most of it, most of it is federal land. So who do you have to go ask permission from in order to build your hotshot canal? You gotta go ask Congress for that authority. And Congress has a lot of representatives from a lot of states. Who has more representatives than any other state in Congress? California. California. So California said, congratulations, Arizona, on the big <laughs> victory. That's wonderful, goody for you. Here's what we'll do. We'll let you build your canal. That's cool. We'll even finance it. Here's the, here's the rub. Here's the pound of flesh that we are requesting. You are going to be junior in this basin if there's ever a shortage. You will take all of the shortage, 100% of it, before we take a drop of shortage. And Arizona looked around and said, there is no way the Colorado River is going to be all that bad a shape. We're not gonna be in a situation where it's gonna get that bad. So let's do the deal. And they did the deal. So they did the Central Arizona Project Act, uh, federal legislation that specifically says that California is senior in perpetuity to Arizona on this river. And again, when you've got it, so we used to think we had a 20 million acre, foot, well, let me just say this real quick too. So we have two, the two largest reservoirs in the nation, in the United States of America, are Lake Mead and Lake Powell on this system. Okay, so here's what I was gonna say. So this is the 20 year period leading up to the compact that I just rambled on about. We had 20 million acre feet of water in this river in this 20 year period of, that was the average, was 20 million acre feet. So we cut up a river into chunks that totaled 16.5 million acre feet, and that made a lot of sense, because we had some left over. If you look at the last 20 year period now, 2023, back to 20, 2003, you see a river that is closer to 10 million acre feet. So we have basically, climate change has cut this river in half. So that's, that's the dilemma. This is from the New York Times. It's kind of hard to see, it's a little washed out. But all these little blue traces below the line are years when we didn't have that much water. And any blue traces above the line are years where we had enough water to satisfy all the uses that were on the system. I'm gonna draw in this year because this year was great. And we had a great year in terms of snowpack and monsoon rains, as you see from all the green grass and lawns around Denver, and it makes, makes tons of sense. But even drawing that line, does, that, that's the point, doesn't get us out of this trend line. This trend line continues to go in the wrong direction. And as a result, we have a lot of work to do that has not yet been done. Um, this is just temperature anomalies. This just shows you what you already know. It's warmer now than it was 20 years ago. And it's warmer by a couple of degrees in this basin. And that has impacted the basin in quite an extreme way. That's Colorado I just drew on there. These are the drought maps. You see these all the time in the news. Um, this is my fav one of my favorite slides in the deck. And, and the reason is in 2016, this, the colored counties, Colorado is right here. The, the counties in the colored uh, uh, area 
are the ideal growing conditions for soy and corn in the United States of America. If you put this data into an artificial or a machine learning algorithm and you ask it if we do nothing different and temperature continues to go up and precipitation even gets a little better, you know, we get a little more rain, this is what you project in 2064. And that means that the ideal conditions for growing things has shifted. There is no color in Nebraska. This is the Cornhusker state. You can't grow corn, you can still grow it, but you're not gonna get the yields that those farmers are used to in 2064 if we do nothing about this trend line. So that's, that's a scary slide if you're in farming because that is a different agronomics, economics for the nation in terms of our bread basket than, uh, than we're used to. Supply chains are different, are gonna be different based on the map on the right versus the map on the left. Uh, politics are gonna be different. There's a whole bunch of uh, a ripple effects that come out from that map coming to pass. So, um, Lake Powell. So this is, uh, this is Lake Powell. This is why, I, I guess I'll explain to you why you're seeing a cross section of Lake Powell. Lake Powell is the big reservoir, if you go back and remember that map I was showing with all the lines on it. Uh, Lake Powell is, you can think of it as the upper basin's reservoir. Uh, that means the upper basin is us, Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Utah. You can think of this as our bucket. It's a federal reservoir, but it's kind of, it's managed in our benefit, for our benefit because it sits just upstream from that Lee Ferry, that, that bifurcation red line that I drew on that last map that shows you where the flow requirement is for this river. The flow of the river is required, we in the upper basin are required or prohibited from letting the flow of the river go below 75 million acre feet in any 10 year period. And if it goes below 75 million acre feet in a 10 year period, then the compact is very clear. It says that the upper basin has to curtail, meaning cut off water users until it gets into compliance. The last 10 year period on, on the Colorado River, we're averaging like 90 million acre feet. That, that's the number. The last 10 year period, we're around 90 million acre feet of water has gone past Lee Ferry. So we're nowhere near the 75 million acre feet uh, where we should start to get nervous. But if you have a couple of bad years in this basin and you can't get water past this dam, then you got a problem because you start eroding that average really quickly. If you put zeros up on the board, you're gonna have a problem. So that's number one and that's this line right here. It's at elevation 3490, and if the uh, amount of Lake Powell drops below 3490, then you can't get water out of this tube, right? And so you can't turn the impellers that generate hydroelectric power. Why is that important? Because if you fail to generate hydroelectric power in, at Glen Canyon Dam, then you are having to, you're forcing your rural electric associations to go to the spot market to purchase power. That's gonna be double, triple, even quadruple the rate that they currently pay the Western Area Power Administration, which is a federal agency that markets the power out of this bucket. So it's very important that the elevation stay above 3490, okay? so. Uh, that's Lake Powell. Lake Mead, well, here's, here's, here's what you're gonna ask, well, where, where is Lake Powell? What, what's the elevation right now as we sit here today? This is from this morning, I pulled this graph off the web, and the blue line is this year. The other colored lines are uh, the past five years. So this trace, this is where we are right here, right now. What does that translate to? That is, a total of uh, 
3573, that's the elevation, and that means PAL is 36.14% full. Uh, we were down to about 23% full uh, back about a year ago. So this year, where we got a lot of snow, we got a lot of monsoon rains, was awesome because it really built up this reservoir. Uh, however, it, we're not out of the woods because I mean, these are big reservoirs. Powell and Mead combined hold 50 million acre feet of water. So if we are only at 36% full, we've got a lot of hill to climb before we're out of the, out of the, the problem. This is like Pal. Sorry, this is like Mead. This is Hoover Dam. Same dynamic. You've got hydroelectric power cut off at, at elevation 950. Uh, you have a, a dead pool at 895. You've got the Southern Nevada Water Authority pipeline, which is water for Las Vegas. Uh, everything from the Bellagio fountains to homes, taps, hotels, everything comes out of this reservoir. So. Uh, that water has got to be above 950 or people in Southern California start running out of load following power, just like at Lake Powell, where, and, and by the way, this is clean. No carbon is emitted when you do this. So this is a problem if you, if you take this offline because there's not enough water to turn those impellers. Because why? You're gonna have to go buy coal-fired power. You're gonna have to go buy natural gas power. Uh, electricity. And that is something that the state of California and other states like ours have said we want to start weaning ourselves off of that uh, hydrocarbon based energy. So this is Lake Mead. Uh, Lake Mead's 34.46% full. And uh, let me flash forward to where we are now. So uh, in 2002, some of you, if you were in Colorado or the West in general, you will remember 2002 because it was the worst drought we had uh, ever had on record. And not by a little, by a lot. And uh, it basically took a brimful Lake Powell and a brimful Lake Mead and cut them in half in one year. That's how bad this drought was. And it was a real wake up call. The federal government said, Hey, we understand you, you states uh, like to call the shots down on that Colorado River there, but uh, uh, you don't have any kind of plan for how to manage these reservoirs to make sure that we don't drop below those elevations that I just whined on and on about. So what we need you to do is come up with a plan. And if you don't come up with a plan, states, then we're going to come up with one for you, and you're not going to like it. Because uh, it's going to basically mean we're going to federalize this river. And if you know anything about rugged individualism in the U.S. West, you know that's a non-starter. We don't like people in Washington, D.C. telling us how to use water in the West. And so we got together real quick, seven states that don't usually get along. Some of us have sued each other in the past. And we, we got together and said, okay, let's do an agreement. And let's make a plan about how we're going to make sure that these reservoirs stay healthy. And so we took five years, but we came up with something called the 2007 Interim Guidelines. And those basically say that Lake Powell and Lake Mead are equal reservoirs. We've cut this river basin in half. We gave seven and a half to the upper, seven and a half to the lower. And we're going to treat this uh, new regime of operating in these interim guidelines uh, that are good until 2026, we're going to treat those as the law of the land. And, and we're going to, you know, we're going to treat both reservoirs equally. So if mead gets pulled down by the lower basin, we're going to replenish it with water from Lake Powell. And that's, that's the, the general way that the 07 interim guidelines work. Um, and those, again, those were supposed to be good until 2026, and then we were going to come back around the table and learn what we had, you know, learn from what we had done and come up with something better. The problem is we didn't make it to 2026. We made it to about 2011, 2012. We saw another really bad suite of years, and the federal government came and said, guess who? It's us again. 
Uh, remember how we told you that uh, it was okay for you to have that 07 guideline thing in place until 2026? You're not going to make it to 2026. And we can't accept failure here. So out came the gun again. And they pointed that out at the states and said, get back around the table and come up with a contingency plan. If the river keeps going south, what are you going to do? Come up with a plan. So they, about 2013, 2014, we started getting around the table again. It took us five years, but we came up with a, a drought contingency plan in 2019. And if you squint real hard, you'll see me sitting down here without this ridiculous mustache, but I was grinning like an idiot because I thought we had solved the river until 2026. I thought it was great. Uh, it turns out we did not. <laughs> here we are in 2023, and actually we made it to about 2021 when the modeling of the river started to show that we weren't going to make it to 2026. So guess who comes knocking? The federal government comes again and they say, out comes the gun again, and this time you don't have five years, you have five weeks to come up with a plan. And the state said, holy crap, we don't know what we're going to do. Uh, this, is, this is trouble. We, it takes us years to negotiate these agreements. So the Secretary of the Interior made the Commissioner of Reclamation a very nice person. Oops named Camille uh, Tootin. She's the Commissioner of Reclamation right there. And she went to the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee and said in June of 2022 that we needed to have a, uh, a plan delivered to her in five weeks by August of 2022 that demonstrated how we were going to cut two to four million acre feet out of this river. And if we didn't come up with the two to four million acre feet, the federal government was gonna do it for us, same old threat. So August came and August went with no state plan. No contingency, contingency plan was delivered and the federal government said, Oh, crap. We're in a bit of a bind here politically because who sits on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the U.S. Senate? A lot of reps from some of the swing states that needed to win their Senate seat in order for the Democrats to control the Senate. And so one of those people was Senator Mark Kelly from Arizona. And Senator Kelly, uh, this is my, now you're getting my abridged, fictional version of what happened. But my read is he heard what she said at, this, at the table in June, and he picked up the phone because what's coming in November? Midterm elections. And he said, uh, President Biden, I really uh, respect your administration. I really like Camille, but she is going to make it so that I can't win my Senate seat if you federalize this river in August, right before the election. So please don't do that. And, the, and, and I think the White House said, okay, message loud, heard loud and clear. We're not going to do that. And as a result, federal government didn't do anything. August 15th came and went and nothing happened. And everybody was looking around going, well, we thought the hammer was coming out. And it didn't, there's no hammer. Then people started going, ah, wait a minute, maybe the November election had something to do with this. And they waited until after the election, but it was still crickets from the federal government. And people, well, now we're in, 20, we're in January of 2023, January 28th of 2023, federal government issues an, a supplemental environmental impact statement for the Colorado River and says, here are the options that we are prepared to uh, entertain if the states continue to wrestle to a stalemate. And uh, option one is we say to California, we are going to enforce your senior priority in this basin. And Arizona, you are in a health and human safety emergency because you have no water for Phoenix or Tucson. If you know anybody, if you have family that lives there, they would have been out of water, literally had to move under option one. 
Option two was just as draconian in the other direction. It said, California, we get it. You won your Supreme Court case. Uh, you, you won your, uh, your, your battle with Arizona over this river. We get it. We get it. You've got senior priority. We're going to read the senior priority that you think you have right the hell out of the law because we cannot have a health and human safety disaster in the United States of America of this magnitude. So sorry, Imperial Valley irrigators that have uh, senior water rights. We're not doing that. So that was option two was just a draconian in the other direction. And then option three was a no action alternative, which was not acceptable to anybody. So what we got in January was the federal government saying, uh, here's, you know, you will admit back in August, the gun was not loaded and you knew it. That's why you didn't act. You're going to watch us load the gun in January, January 28th to be exact. And they did. And so then the states said, oh geez. And they huddled very quickly in places like Vegas and San Diego. And they still couldn't get it done. And the lower basin states said, uh, you know, our state, Colorado, pointed the finger down at the lower basin and said, they're overusing water. And they were. But the lower basin said, Sorry, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, but you know what's done is done, and there's no way for us out of this box. We've got to keep the nation's economy and food security strong, and we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And and so that was an impasse, a stalemate, and uh, the lower basin read the room and decided, here's what we're going to do. And I know I'm I'm at 246. Uh, uh, the they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that uh, the lower basin is protected. And they came up with a plan to cut 1 million acre feet. Now remember, the order was 2 to 4 million acre feet. They came up with one, and they slid that across the desk. And guess who picked up that paper and said, that's good enough for us? The federal government said, OK, good enough. So we still have a problem, is the moral of this story. It's on all of us to figure it out. It's not, help is not coming from Washington. This is a live feed from Washington right now. Uh, so um, I think I could go on and on for days and days, as you can imagine. But I'm going to stop here. And I don't know, do we have time for any questions or do we have to go to the next thing? We can take a couple. We can take a couple questions? Yeah. And then I could. Great question. Yep. That's right. There are 29 sovereign, uh, federally recognized Indian tribes in the Colorado River Basin. And they all have claims to federal reserved water rights. And those federal reserved water rights get to date back to the time of the reservation or the treaty, and depending on the reservation or the, the tribe. And as a result, the, the tribes have senior water rights. Now, here's the problem. They have not, some of them have. The Gila River Indian community is a good example of a tribe that has put their water to a beneficial use, a consumptive use. And so therefore, their portfolio is fairly strong. If you go to the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, uh, that homestead, you know, that, that's where the, those, that would the, that was the land that my great-great-grandparents homesteaded on, was belonged to the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. And those tribal members have never been given the infrastructure to put their water out of Lake Nighthorse to a beneficial use. And so somebody's from Ignacio here. Uh, so when you don't give somebody the ability to put the water to a consumptive use, you might as well be telling them that their water rights aren't worth anything. Because they can't do it, they can't, they can't conserve water if they've never used it before. And so the tribes are in this really difficult position where they want to help the river. They know they have senior water rights, but they don't have, it's like being invited to a poker game and not being given any chips. And it's like, well, this is no fun. I can't do anything with this. 
So that's basically the, the tribal. And you asked a question, and I don't know if I ever answered it. Yes. How exactly does one define that? Is there like some level that's super specific? Or Each state has its own definition of what a legally recognized beneficial use is. And it's basically your consumptive use. So if I put it on my field and I grow alfalfa with it, that usually takes about three acre feet an acre. If I grow wheat, that's two acre feet an acre. If I grow beans like you eat at Chipotle in your burrito, that'll be one acre foot an acre. So generally the duty of water is known. It's a scientific question, not a political question, but the policy that's developed around in each state varies in some subtle ways. Yeah. What's our path forward? So the path forward is for you to, whenever you hear from your state elected officials or your county commissioners or your, your, whether it's your governor or your state legislators, do not let them, don't give them a free pass on this blaming the lower basin business. That doesn't get us anything. It's fine, it may, may make them feel good at night, it might make us all feel good at night to blame somebody else, but we can't stop there. We have got to make sure that we are getting, there are $4 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act. There are $8.3 billion in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and both those tranches of money are dedicated to Western water. We in Colorado should be getting some of that to conserve water and be paid to do so. If we don't do that, then it's our own fault because we're up here pointing the finger down at the lower basin. Guess where all that money's gonna go? It's gonna go to the lower basin. So we've gotta do, we've gotta stand up for ourselves when it comes to how much money federal resources are being deployed on this problem. That's number one. Number two, we can help ourselves out by doing some simple things. We're in the Department of Law. They represent all the state agencies. It's the law firm for the state. They need to be instructing their clients and their clients need to be advocating for things like gray water use. We can do indoor gray water use under a regulation, Regulation 86. How many counties have opted into Reg 86 in the state of Colorado? Local governments, about six have opted in. And we have 64 counties alone, plus the home rule municipalities. So we, we can do better on gray water. We can do better on the Denver Basin aquifer underneath our feet on the front range. That is an undervalued, undertapped resource. And we can do better on our negotiations with, on the Colorado River. So that's my, what do we do next? That, that's my answer. All right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, grass, grass replacement's important, right? Like, we, we, if, if the only thing that touches a, a, a piece of grass is a lawnmower, it probably shouldn't be there, right? There's something we can all do. If you're in a homeowners association or if you're in a community and you see that crap going on, where you see those medians with grass that nobody plays, they're not big enough to throw a ball in or do anything with, and yet we, we essentially waste a lot of water on those. No, they should be rocks. <laughs> well, all rocks does make it hotter though. There is Heat island effect is a real thing, no doubt about that. But there are places where we can make the switch to native grasses. The Denver Botanic Gardens has two pilots. If you drive by on York or Josephine, you can see what I'm talking about. And that can be, that can, that can add to uh, the um, cooling effect that we need to see on our surfaces without using so much water, so. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Eklund. Right. Thank you. Thank you all.